Um, when I first saw the map, it looked like this. And so I was quite shocked because it was just in such a mess. If you look here, you've got really obvious eyesore repairs and it was just undisplayable. So yes, you can see here, it was tenting and arching and just so stiff you could, you just couldn't move it, let alone roll it, hang it on the wall. So my first thoughts were, how did the map end up in looking like that? Because I was visibly shocked. And how did it end up in the National Archives in the first place? Because why have we got such a huge giant map? So I found out that once the map's purpose had been realised in Prince Edward Island, it was originally commissioned by the Board of Trade in Great Britain. So once they had divided the lots up, it was, I think, folded, because you can see, can you see all these kind of regular kind of squares and lines if you look quite closely on the map so yeah you can see you kind of got panels going all along and because they're all quite regular and there's 24 it makes quite a lot of sense it may have been folded on a ship back to britain because it's so huge how else could it how else would you transport a piece of paper back so once, it, once the map had been, um, once the map had come back to Britain, it was then given to the Colonial Office Library, and that would have probably been in the 1800s sometime. And then all the maps in the Colonial Office Library were put on a roll. So this might have been the first time this map had been rolled and that probably would have been on quite a rough linen with animal adhesive. And then this would have all been put on a roll and stored away. And then in 1935, it came to the Public Record Office, which later became the National Archives. And then in 1973, it experienced treatment as it came to the repair department. So we don't have any records of what the map would have been like when it came in 1973 to the repair department. So all we can assume is that it was possibly torn or the original lining had disintegrated. So the process in 1973 was to make the objects indestructible, to make, to get through as many objects as they can so kind of like a factory line conveyor belt system so they came up with a process which they thought at the time with the best of intentions was the right thing to do so this map was put onto a material called holland cloth which i have here so you kind of get the feeling it's very stiff and just not you can't roll that, can you? <laughs> it's coincidentally called Holland Cloth. <laughs> its um, intended use was as kitchen blind material. Yeah. So, so the, the treatment in 1973 would have been, the map itself would have been removed from its old lining dry, and then this would have been in pieces, and then they would have probably sponged each piece wet and then this would have been pasted on onto the holland cloth so this is just an example of what happens when you put glue onto this cloth and this is just quite a thin amount of glue i've put on this particular sample the glue that was on this map was very very thick and the previous animal glue that had stuck to the previous cloth before hadn't been removed either 
So if you want to pass that round with a touch. So once each sheet had been placed on this cloth, it then would have had silk placed on the front of it. And this is the actual silk that I removed from the map. So you can see at the time it would have been translucent, but over the years it's disintegrated and become yellow. So it kind of gives a very cloudy appearance and you can just see even when you put it over that, you can see what a difference the colours are. So. Yeah, that would have been glued on with the, uh, onto the whole of the front of the map. And then you can see... You can see, like, the border and, like, the white patches. On top of the silk, that was the border and repairs were put on top of silk. So it was more about because there was severe tearing, they thought if they had these kind of finger repairs and border, this would help protect those tears. So with a lot of thick layers of glue and material, it was just an incompatible, it was just incompatible. So inevitably the damage was happening because when you think about materials, when they're wet, they shrink. So when you put your jeans in the wash, they do shrink. The pa paper has the opposite reaction. It expands when it's wet. And then, so you've got this sandwich of the holland cloth shrinking, the paper expanding, the silk shrinking, the paper repairs on top expanding. And then when it's dry, the paper contracts again, the material expands. So because they're not having the same behaviours, it just goes like so you get these severe tenting and arching. And for it to roll, I don't believe it was ever dried. So it probably would have been rolled wet because having felt the Holland cloth, you can see how stiff it was. If it had dried, how could you roll that? So the only way I can believe it could have been rolled was that it was never dried in the first place. And the roll that it was put on was about three to four inches wide. So it's on this tight coil drying. And <laughs> so once the treatment had been done, they thought, okay, it's robust, it can roll. It just went back into storage and hopefully, like when it was requested, it would be strong and not going to fall apart. So inevitably, although well intended, a completely inappropriate treatment which was probably damaging the map more than probably when it came into the repair department in 1973. So I think probably in late 2013 the Confederation Centre requested the map for loan for this exhibition which the National Archives accepted the loan request and then in March 2014, I was then able to start work on the map. So the first thing that was when I started in March was to take all the materials off from the 1973 treatment because they were just not beneficial in any way to the map. And they were the materials causing all the damage. So once you could remove those, the paper had a bit more, the map itself had a bit more of a chance to be healthy again, I suppose. <laughs> so the first thing that I did was remove all the front repairs, which you can see there. So that was just done with a series, that was done with moisture, so just damp compresses with moisture and that was just applied directly to the front repairs and then after half an hour they were able to be peeled away. So once all the front repairs were removed in the border we then had to carefully turn the map over 
the map itself, because it was so, so stiff and rolling, it was really difficult. It was always quite scary because you felt like, oh God, is it going to crack <laughs> further? <laughs> so anyway, once we turned the map over, unfortunately, because Holland cloth is a kitchen blind material, it's waterproof. <laughs> So, conventional methods of removing backings would normally be moisture, but as it was waterproof, all moisture just sat on top and was just repelling. So, so it was like, how do we get the moisture to penetrate through? So, I had worked out that if you sand and disrupt the surface of the cloth, the moisture could penetrate through. Unfortunately, when I was doing it, it was like little bits of sandpaper, so it was kind of, there wasn't, I wasn't given that much time. If I had had to use sandpaper, I'd probably still be here now trying to remove the backing because it's so huge. So it was trying to think of ways, how can I make this quicker? So we, we thought of an electric sander to go all across the back of the map. <laughs> So I'd spend about 10 minutes every morning. I had to come in early and spend about 10 minutes every morning sanding the back so it didn't disturb other people because it's very loud. <laughs> <laughs> so I would do a section a day and then because it had been sanded back, you could then apply moisture, so kind of damp compresses and weight them down and then after about 45 minutes, the cloth could peel away so you can see I was able to then just peel it away there. And you can see all the glue. So that's the animal glue as well as the clam adhesive that they used in 1973 on the back. So that was causing the paper to be brittle. So yeah, that's me once it had finished. So you can kind of see how wavy and how split it is there. And it doesn't look like it could, it's, it just doesn't, it's not flexible. So once all the backing had been removed, we then removed the silk. So that was done with hot steam. So that softened the glue enough so then the silk could be peeled away. Thankfully, it came away clean, so we were okay. But the difference in the silk was quite incredible because if you can see, I'm not sure where the silk is, but it's very, very yellow. So details such as all the trees along the coastline and lines of the compass lines and lines of longitude and latitude were quite hard to see and text in the table there was very hard to read. I would find it hard to read now, but like it was virtually impossible to read <laughs> with the silk on top because it just visually impaired it all and also the island itself as you can see here it jumps out at you it almost kind of disappeared with the silk on it and it had a kind of milky trans a milky murky kind of appearance with the silk on and colors such as the blues around the coastline and the pinks and the yellows they were just visually disrupted so the blues were greener the yellows disappeared and the pinks became like brownish in appearance so ultimately by being able to remove the silk its appearance improved dramatically straight away and also once all those materials had been removed the map could then fall into pieces so once it had fallen into pieces, it was, it, we could tell things about the map we couldn't tell before. So I was able to work out that the map had about, was made of 20 sheets of handmade good quality paper and that you could tell, okay, it's been folded. I was quite convinced by this point because it was in 24 main rough sections that it must have been folded. And also quite interestingly, like around the top, there seems to be quite an irregular border. So I'm not sure when that might have been, and the bottom as well. So you can see there's like this irregular border and that is a different type of paper. So I'm not sure quite when that was added, but as it came with the map, I've kept it there. But 
it just shows that at some stage, even before 1973, it had been altered. So that's just a little thing I learned when all the materials came off. And also you could see things like the watermarks of the paper, so you knew it was good quality paper. So once all, because once all the materials had come off, the paper was still very, very rock solid and brittle due to the glue on the front and all the adhesive on the back. So the next stage was to remove that adhesive. So the first stage was with each individual piece, which was quite a relief when it was small because you could then be like, I can actually do this on a much more manageable scale. Now I can actually work at a table on a normal bench. So to remove the adhesive on the back, it was a series of damp compresses with Gore-Tex, so the material for waterproof jackets, so that lets moisture penetrate through quite slowly. So when I did conventionally how you would do it normally, it, because the glue layers were so, so thick, it was taking well over nearly three hours or so for the glue to soften so you could scrape it away. So that was just too long because I just didn't have time to wait for that. So heat speeds up reaction. So the hot water bottles were used <laughs> <laughs> to speed that reaction up. Someone did suggest an electrical blanket, but because there was water and electricity, I didn't think that was necessarily the safest idea. But <laughs> yeah, so. The hot water bottle sped that reaction up quite quickly, so within 45 minutes to an hour, the glue had softened so much that you could actually just scrape it away. So 45 minutes to an hour is a lot better than waiting three hours. So even though it looks a bit comical, it, it's worth doing. <laughs> so yeah, you can see that's, you can get an idea of how thick that glue was. It looks a bit like earwax. It's just, <laughs> it, yeah, so, so once each piece had all the glue removed from the back, so that was done for the whole thing, so that took about a month to do, just to remove that glue from the back. We then had to wash every piece because you couldn't really scrape the glue off the front because you might damage the media in the front of the map. So. Once I tested all the watercolour and the paper to make sure that none of that would run, we could then wash it. So um, we had to use a paddling pool for that <laughs> and two screens. Um, the paddling pool was used because I was trying to find a large tray, but that took... They said to me that it would take over two months to deliver, so that's not good because I had to get on with it like right there and then so the only thing that we could come up with quite quickly was oh, a paddling pool it contains water it can sit flat and the screens were used because the piece of paper each piece was actually quite torn and some areas were very skin so literally all you're seeing is just the media of the map itself so you could, it was quite scary actually. So you, you couldn't just put the piece of paper in a bath of water because there would be no way of me safely getting it back out again. So the screens were used as support. So it was two screens on top of each other. So the mesh to mesh. And then the piece you can see is just placed on the top screen. And then once, so, each piece was humidified for a bit so the glue on the front could soften and then we would just brush distilled water on the surface of the paper to help agitate and remove that glue. So once every piece had been washed in that way it was gently pressured dried and then once it had dried the flexibility and it felt a bit like paper again how paper should feel so that was a step in the right direction and the colours became a bit brighter as well. So that's, that was quite a very badly torn piece. Which bit's that? <laughs> that? That bit is this bit here. <coughs> so 
So you can see how severely torn it is and how if you can imagine if you put that in a full bath of water there's no way you're getting that out safely because it wasn't actually it was still in one piece but the tears were so long that it was just holding it together by like less than a centimeter of paper so you can kind of see there it was all being held by a little little fragments so that was the piece that was probably one of the mo more damaged pieces in fairness but still quite horrendously torn so yeah that's what it looked like once I'd repaired that so that was done with quite thin Japanese tissue and very thin adhesive on the back of that piece so we repaired all the pieces in exactly the same way so I'll say did you repair each tear Um, I, at this stage, it was just very thin strips to just support the tears at that stage. So once all the um, so once all the pieces had been repaired, it was a case of realigning it. And unfortunately, because the paper had been through quite a lot, so it had expanded and contracted at different rates the pieces would never fit back together perfectly how Holland would have had them. And I believe that because of it being possibly folded, that parts of it had experienced loss on every join as well because someone had cut on every join. So that would kind of make sense why parts of it won't match up because someone had cut just around the folded parts, which would have been the weaker parts and maybe discarded that. So once it came to realigning, I was just on the table and then jigsawing it back together, basically. So that took about three days to try and visually get something I felt looked good. Because as soon as you put one piece together and you think, oh, that looks good, you'll get a massive gap going elsewhere. So it was a case of okay you have to compromise although you could bring certain pieces together closer and they would look okay it would look really off elsewhere so once i had established a f arrangement that i thought looked good we, i then added registration marks to the table so then i could put add repairs to the front so that was done with just strips of paper um, strips of japanese tissue and then that held it together. So this was just added to the front because when it comes to lining, it expands and contracts at different rates. So I didn't know what the final infill size would be. So there it is once I put it, pieced it back together. So that's just before lining. So that was ready to go for lining. So the lining process itself is probably I, I feel the most important conservation step in this whole process of the year and it was the most challenging as well because it's such a huge item how do you go about doing it so after quite a lot of research and collaborating with the British Museum and the V&A and the Bodleian Library in Oxford we we two conservators at the National Archives built the bridge there and the platform so we were able to work so the bridge just enabled us to be able to actually go to the center of the map because to, for it to be lined the map the whole map needed to be slightly damp and flat so once it's slightly damp and flat it's, you can't just go on it not that you would walk on the map anyway but as it's so massive you can't roll it you can't do those things so the only way of working is with the bridge so the differences from 73 with the lining was that we lined it with paper this time because paper on paper would have a similar expansion and contraction rate so you wouldn't ex experience the tenting in the same way as 73 and because the materials are like for like it would be more flexible 
as a result of that. And also the glue that I used this time around, as opposed to from 1973, was a very, very milk thin wheat starch paste. So these materials are all reversible. So if anyone wants to undo my work, they can quite quickly undo it all. <laughs> but, and also because there's nothing on the front, the paper can just move and expand and contract as it would like to. And the lining paper we used was probably about the quarter of the weight of a regular A4 sheet of copy paper. So really, really, really thin. So that took about over a hundred, for the first lining alone, that was over about, I think it's 104 sheets of that paper just to cover that whole surface. So that was done, so we just did, you can see here that that's a sheet of lining paper that's being placed down. So this was done in rows. And then as you can imagine a brick wall, every alternating row would alternate along. So it would end up looking a bit like a brick wall and the overlaps were very, very few, um, very small, like three mil, five mil at most. So once we had lined that, it was a case of turning the map over. So if you can imagine a giant, huge, wet piece of paper, that's not easy to do. And I, would, I can admit for myself, that's the most terrifying part of the whole conservation process was turning the map over. Because if someone just made a mistake, then that would be it. You would have just, if that had torn, would have had a really, really hard time repairing that. <laughs> so to turn the map over, we had to insert plastic pipes underneath it. And then that required 12 people to just do that one bit. So, and seven pipes. So as you can see there, that's the first pipe. And then as you're going along, more and more pipes are lifting this map up. So this is so it could pressure dry and that was so you need an even you need to have a sandwich of felts and blotters boards and weights to make sure that the map doesn't move and go into contort into weird shapes because if I left that to air dry there was no way that would ever stay reasonably flat at all so you can see us flipping the map over here onto the pre-prepared felts and we did the lining three times. So we had to spend 15 hours each day when we had the lining days themselves, just making sure that that was completed because you can't really start the lining and then not finish it through because it will go weird. So it was just a case of very long days, but everyone had quite good spirits and was quite up for this. So. So, yeah, we, so we had to line that map three times. So the first two linings were with very thin Japanese paper, which is about the quarter of the weight of copy paper, which I just said before. And then the last lining was with a slightly thicker paper. So that was about half the weight of copy paper. The reason we do it with layers as opposed to just using one thick layer of paper is because it's much harder for paper to tear if you have layers of it, even if it's two thinner sheets than one thicker sheet, because you can just tear paper like that. But when you start layering it, it becomes much harder to do that. So it's preferable to do it in thin layers than use one thick sheet. And also the added benefit of layering it is that it helps pull out the map flatter because paper has a memory. So if you think about po when you buy a poster, it comes on a roll sometimes, but it never really goes flat. That's, that's what we're contending with. This map will never ever truly go flat because it's been rolled for probably the best part of 95% of its life. So it's not going to forget that easily. 
So once this had been lined three times and pressure dried three times, it, we then tension dried it, which you can see here, which just needed us to spray the map lightly so it would go flat. And then we adhered it onto the platform by just pasting it. So it's just basically a case of stretching the map flat and then just taping it down to the board. And so that our board's the platform and our tape is Japanese paper and quite a thick wheat starch, wheat starch paste to make sure that it's not moving anywhere. To make sure that the map itself didn't stick to the platform because that would have been quite disastrous as well. <laughs> We had a paper tab on the very far end, so round there. And then we had a bicycle pump, and then it was just pumping air underneath to make sure that the map didn't stick to the platform. Normally, you would just like blow underneath because you would, say, be working on something K3, but I don't have the lung capacity for that. <laughs> <so>. <laughs> So yeah, that's yeah. We got we got a guy in the department to he he really wanted to do it, so he was just pumping the bicycle pump. So gave gave us all a bit of a rest really. So then the map was covered with polythene, and then that was left to dry for two months slowly. So yeah. So if we had left it to the environment, it would have dried out too quickly. So it just needed that slow pr drying process so the expansion and contraction wasn't violent because if it dries quickly, that's more violent and it's more likely to tear as well. So once it had dried for a couple of months, it was then time back to work again on it. <laughs> it was a case of removing around the the false borders that we had applied. So we took those off so it wasn't tensioned anymore. So that was just done by inserting a spatula all around and just gently going, tearing around the outside, so quite straightforward, really. And then I had to trace every single loss because there was a lot of losses. So if you can see, you probably can't see, but when you get a chance afterwards, you can kind of see all around each of the folds. There's, there's it coloured infill paper, so up there. So, yeah, there's quite there, there's some there. So there as well, there's quite a bit. So that, to do that, we had to trace every single loss on there so that was quite a lot so that was done on the bridge with tracing paper going over the whole map and then I found a kind of sympathetic craft paper that looked quite similar to the map itself so I spent a while just with watercolour paint just painting, painting out sheets of this paper various shades of brownie beige <laughs> and you'd be surprised by how many different shades that I had to paint to fit the whole map because it wasn't a case of there's just one shade it's a multiple of different shades so so you can see I was quite a messy worker so it's just bits of paper everywhere just random pieces just placing it down on the map seeing does it match or is it a good match so that's kind of a typical loss so you can see all along there that you've got it, you can see the lining and there's nothing there so what did you tint it with watercolor just various shades of watercolor paper so that's just painted out and so to do that, you just trace. So to do that repair, you just got the tracing that corresponded with that bit and you've found your color match and then 
you just flip the tracing paper around, drew the, out the tracing, and then need with a needle just gently ease that shape out, and then just adhered it into place. So you can see that it's quite a sympathetic match, so you wouldn't notice it. Whereas the if I hadn't done that, you would be looking at a load of white lines of lining paper otherwise. So once once all those toned in fills were completed, we then we then turn the map over again and then with a large pebble we burnish the back. So I suppose it's like the map getting a hot stone massage or something. <laughs> um, <laughs> so we just kind of um, rub this large pebble on the back so that just increased the flexibility again and helped make it more flexible so it could roll even more easily and then the lining was trimmed to size so there's the final and there's the final map so um, unfortunately I can't show you the pictures of transportation because we didn't get the computer to work so you, you have to use your imagination <laughs> so once this had been pressed for a couple of months back in queue, so last, so last Friday, not a week, a week from, so just over a week and a half ago, we rolled the map. So the difference between the roll in '73 was three inches. This time it was 16 inches wide, so 42 centimetres wide, so very wide. So when, when we rolled it, so we rolled it that way, so that way up. So it was about two and a half rotations. So it's quite a gentle roll. And then, so this was then rolled up and then we secured that and then covered that with polythene to make sure it was waterproof. And then we had a case, a crate, sorry, specially built and that had plastizote support so the roll could then sit in this crate and not move. And then this was taken to a warehouse in London and then my boss Jürgen over there took, flew out with it last Monday. So then this was flown out to Halifax and then once it was arrived in Halifax it then made it, the crate was then loaded onto a truck and then made its way over the Confederation Bridge to here. So I'm not quite sure how long that took but best part of my, I think it might have been nearly 24 hours just from travelling from Kew to start with to here. So uh, the whole day really. And then it was unpacked, unrolled and then pressed. And then the mounting you see here, so this is actually a magnetic wall. So if you look up very carefully at the top, you can see a bar. That's actually a magnet. So I had researched magnet mounting and having conversations with the Confederation Center here the staff built this wall, so that was very good. So it's actually, to make it magnetic, it's plywood and then the whole wall is a sheet of metal and then there's been map ball put on top and then the, mag the map and then the magnets placed on top. So each magnet has a 10 kilo pull, so it's not going anywhere, it's not gonna fall off. <laughs> So it's very, very, very strong, these magnets. So they, the map's not going anywhere because the map probably weighs five or six kilos. So that's probably like 11, 12 pounds. So, so there's about 28 magnets at the top alone. So safe as houses, it's not going anywhere. <laughs> so to hang it, we then rolled it again the same way we rolled it to transport it here. So from the bottom up. And then this required, I think, I think in the end it was like nine people were, were involved in hanging this. So two people had to hold the roll and then two people were supporting the roll on the sides as well. And then we had ladders. So we were all just securing the magnets and gently unrolling it down and then securing it into place. So you can see like the small magnets here. 
So that's just to make sure that it's not flapping and moving. And yeah, this is the final result of all this hard work. <laughs> to say thank you to everyone that was involved in this as well because there was quite a lot of people who did a hell of a lot of work it wasn't just me so, <laughs> so so without them it wouldn't have been possible for this to have been achieved at all and I just also would like to thank the Confederation Centre as well for raising the money and for helping with the wall and everything because this has been quite a special experience for me so, as well so yeah, thank you <laughs>